good morning and welcome to worship at Living Hope Church this February 7th. And we want to have a welcome to all of you here on the physical campus and to all of you who um, are there on the online campus. Uh, we're looking forward to worshiping the Lord together and finding out what he does as he continues to lead us into the future he has prepared for us. So a couple of announcements before we get um, started with our, our first set of uh, worship music. Uh, first, our friend uh, Mikey Gill is working on putting together a book club that we're calling uh, the Living Hope Readers. And uh, they will have a, a meeting February 27th right here in our building. And when they do, or by Zoom, if you want to do it by Zoom, if you want to read and discuss by Zoom, um, they're going to be going through the book House, uh, written by Peretti and Decker. And uh, that sounds like a, a powerful book. And um, if you interested to give Mikey a call or uh, contact the church. Um, but get the book, read it, come ready to make your observations and have a great time. Uh, Christian fellowship um, through the, the mode of literature. Well, we've got a couple of introductions this morning to make. Um, last week we introduced, uh, well, we didn't introduce, but we featured uh, a number of our worship team, uh, Ricardo Gonzalez. Uh, raise your hand, Ricardo. Yeah, a big hand for Ricardo. Um, he, he's a fine Christian brother who's been serving the Lord for a long time through his music, and we're just delighted to have um, uh, both his uh, love for the Lord and his um, incredible skill in guitar uh, working with us. And then I think uh, Dave Whitaker has an announcement or an introduction to make as well. So you've probably been wondering, some of you, uh, who this handsome young man is back here playing trumpet. This is uh, Austin Otovich. Austin is uh, Dave Otovich's grandson. Uh, Dave is our drummer. And as you can tell, uh, Austin, handsome man, takes after his grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Austin played with us for a while, and then he, he moved away for a short time. Now he's back, and he's playing trumpet. And we just really appreciate all that he's adding to our worship. <laughs> well, we're going to celebrate today. The Lord has called us to holiness. The Lord has called us to repentance. When we repent, then the Lord steps in and, and fills our heart with joy. Would you stand with me and welcome those of you on live streaming? We're going to sing Joy to the World, Unspeakable Joy.
praise you. We give you an applause, Lord. You are wonderful. It is you that we are following, Father. It is you. Our prayer today is that all the words that come out of our mouths, all the thoughts that go through our mind, all the actions that we take today, Lord, will be a blessing to you. We stand in your presence, in this holy place. It is holy because you are here, God. You are here to receive our praise, our thanks, our gratitude. You're also here to touch us when we are in need. Lord, we pray for the people that are dealing with physical pain, that you will touch them and give them some relief from this pain, Lord, that you'll heal their bodies, that you'll heal our minds, that you'll heal our emotions. Lord, just prepare us so that we can better worship you today. The second verse of of Holy, Holy, Holy has some words in there that (coughs) we've changed in the past to make them more modern. But today we're going to do the more of the traditional words. At the end of verse 2 it says, which wert and art and evermore shalt be. And the the flow of those words are so beautiful. In the past, we've changed the word to was, and we've changed art to is, and we've changed evermore shalt be to shall or to will be. But today, as we sing those words, don't let the oldness of those words interfere with your worship, but allow it the words, the way they sound when you sing them to just bless you. Holy, holy, holy.
Lord is here for those who feel abandoned. The Lord is here for those who feel as if you have failed. We make mistakes. We make poor choices. We choose to do the wrong thing. But we also come to the Lord today and we say, Lord, teach me, follow me, or lead me, let me follow you. Reveal to me what I need to change. And when you say it's wrong, I'm going to say no to it. And I know that I will be able to fulfill your command to be coming ho more holy every day because you stay. You don't abandon me like I run away from you. You run toward me. You're the perfect father who sees me coming back and you run to me. So those who are discouraged, those who feel shame, those who feel separated, let the Lord, great spirit, move in you today. I knew I would have given up on me by now. Have labeled me a lost cause because I feel just like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. I would have labeled me beyond repair because I feel like I'm beyond repair. But somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still there. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done to separate my heart from the God who stays. Oh, I used to hide. Every time I thought I'd let you down, I always thought I had to earn my way. But I'm learning you don't work that way. But somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. Oh, you're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms, and you tell me nothing I have ever done to separate my heart from the God who stands. Oh, shame can't separate my guilt, can't separate my past, can't separate. I'm yours forever, my sin can separate my scars, can separate my failure, can separate I'm yours forever, my enemy can separate, no power of hell can take away your love for me. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done to separate my heart from the God who stays. You're the God who Thank you, worship team, and you may be seated. 
I know it sounds a little bit uh, late in the year to do this, but I want to start by thanking you for the, um, the generous Christmas cash gift that I received back in December. Um, uh, it was unexpected and didn't know quite what to do with it, but I thought, you know, something. this is what I do with cash gifts. Um, I'm going to save that up and uh, spend it on something I would never buy for myself, but would be bring me a lot of joy. And so... Um, well, I'm, I'm wearing my new Apple Watch. <laughs> so, so, so thanks. Um, and, and every time I, um, I find out that I'm three pounds too heavy, um, I will bless you for your, your kindness to me once again. It's got s- several great new apps on it. Um, one of the most innovative one is one that automatically detects when you're washing your hands and it has a little countdown for 20 seconds. And so, you know, it counts down, and when it buzzes, you know that you can be done with washing your hands. Um, I don't know who came up with that idea, but it, it's, it's wonderful. And so I've been running that just mostly for fun to see what it's like. And um, This morning I had my, my morning breakfast coffee, and I went into the kitchen to kind of rinse it out a little bit, and that... And then when I'm done, all of a sudden, the watch goes off and says, you didn't spend 20 seconds washing your hands. So maybe it needs to be fine-tuned just a little bit. <laughs> I say yesterday, we had a tremendous crowd of uh, hardworking people. It was a large number of uh, hardworking people uh, who really worked together to uh, clean up our building. Um, we did such a good job cleaning up that we filled up a dump truck but not just a dump truck. We filled up a dump truck and a utility trailer, but not just one utility trailer, two utility trailers. Um, and so the folks at the transfer station thought that we were like Christmas to them because we showed up with all this stuff. Um, but thanks to all of you that, that helped out and, uh, and the, the planning and the preparation, uh, the, the working together, it was a great experience. And that kind of leads us into our worship to our sermon theme, which is rebuilding God's group. And that's not the most important thing that we do, but it's a, it's certainly a, a significant thing that as we prepare for the future, we're kind of cleaning the decks of the, the tool that God's given us in our physical building and making sure that it's ready to go for whatever God calls us to as we um, are rebuilding God's group. And last week, Pastor Debbie shared with us how uh, rebuilding God's group as we're going through the book of Nehemiah is um, partly, maybe about one-third about actually rebuilding the wall and rebuilding the physical structure. And the other two-thirds is about building the spiritual and relational and emotional structures. And so she talked about the importance of being uh, ourselves being restored by God. And she broke it down into the the three words that we have on the screen. Um, Confession, which is a, a movement of the lips, she told us. Um, conviction, which is a, a movement of the mind, and then, of course, that follows into change, which is a movement within life. And I, I love the way that she kind of gave us something to hang on to with the word repentance, that it's a deliberate redirection for the future. And so we're going to build on that as we move into Nehemiah 8 this morning. We'll be looking at Nehemiah 8 uh, pretty much the whole thing in depth. Uh, we're going to look at it from the, from the lens of tools of grace. Uh, four tools of grace that God brings to us to bring us into that restoration. And the first tool of grace that God uses to restore us is the Bible. And so if you have your Bible, uh, you can turn to it and uh, look in Nehemiah 8. And... Uh, we'll look at the reading of the law and the, the wonderful things that it did for the people of Judah. So we're going to start off with Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 8. So when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled into all of their towns, uh, the wall was done by this time, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law, the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. 
And so on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought out the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak until noon. Just think about how long that might have been, from daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, the women, and others who could understand. And the people that whole time stood and listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. And beside him stood, well, 13 people whose names we can't pronounce. Uh, verse 5, um, Ezra opened the book. And all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And, and he opened it and all the people stood up. And Ezra prayed, praised the Lord, the great God of heaven. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, it lists the, the 13 of them, uh, those folks instructed the people in the law. They instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. And we'll look at the rest of the story in just a minute, but we can stop there for a while. Um, the, the Bible, in terms of grace, the Bible is a wonderful tool of God's grace because it makes us aware of the places where we need grace. It highlights to us, you know, in this area, this is where you need grace. And for all of us, it's a little bit different. Uh, Dave's already mentioned some of those areas of grace, the needs that we have. Sometimes it's a need that we have that God wants to highlight through Scripture to say, I can take care of that need. Sometimes it's a hurt that God says, I can heal. Sometimes it, it's, a, it's a sin where God says, you know, that's really not doing you as much good as you think. Um, I can change you at that point too. But the, the Bible is that individual tool that brings us to an awareness of where God wants to flood us with his grace and with his transformation, with his restoration. Um, verse 2, it says that this was the first day of the seventh month. And the first day of the seventh month was for their, uh, for their civil uh, life, uh, for the life together as people outside of the, the church life. That was their New Year's Day. So think about this. What a way to spend New Year's Day. They got up early. They were out in the church square at daybreak, and they stayed there until lunchtime, standing, listening to the teacher of the law, just read the Bible for them. Just read the Bible. That was their New Year's Day celebration. Um, it tells us that um, not only were the men there, but also the women there and all the, I assume that means children that could understand. All the men understood, all the women understood, and then uh, all the, the youth and children that could understand. And this was at a time, by the way, of course, you know where I'm going here. This was at a time... Um, when we, most people didn't think that women could understand anything of a spiritual nature. And they were good for making babies and raising babies and uh, cooking good food. But they really didn't know anything about spiritual issues or, or business issues or, or real life issues. You kept them at home and kept them busy. And so it, it's a radical departure from their culture. They're pushing ahead on God's agenda for the equality of men and women and of youth and children as well to say, if, if you can get an idea of what this means, you're invited and you're a full-fledged participant in this spiritual exercise. Um, and it's an interesting thing because this day that we're reading about in Nehemiah 8, this day is one of the probably the four biggest turning points in uh, the history of the Israelites. Uh, of course, there's the, the time when they left Egypt, the, the time when they were uh, taken from Egypt and taken to Babylon, and the time when they came back. And this is a critical time because they're moving from um, a temple-oriented people to a Bible-oriented people. Until this time, what it meant to be a, a good Jewish person, which really meant good Jewish man, was that... Um, on 
the Sabbath on Saturday or Friday night, you would go down to the temple and you would watch and enjoy the ministry of the priests. And that was basically your responsibility, that you would watch and enjoy the ministry of the priests while you're at the temple. But at this point, it's switching to where what it means to be a Jewish person is that you understand the Bible in your heart. From being able to watch and enjoy the, the priestly performance on s Saturday morning to understand the Bible in your heart, they became not so much a temple, or they, they still had a temple, but they weren't, that wasn't the center point, the core of what it meant to be Jewish was no longer the temple, it was the Bible, and they became known as the people of the book. It, a lot of reasons. Number one, they're dispersed and they can't all get to the temple anymore. But it's a marvelous thing for us as we can kind of connect and say, well, yeah, that's what we want to be as well. People who are, that understand and obey God's word. And then the word understanding. One more thing to tease out here. Verses 2, verse, verses two, three, 8, and 12 all, all focus on this thing of understanding. So they heard the Bible being read to them non-stop for four, five, maybe six hours. But the important thing is not that they are hearing it or even that they're believing it. It's that they are understanding it. Of course, we know that understanding moves beyond just knowledge to where uh, I have the ability to use that knowledge to do something important in my own life. It's not just hearing the word or believing the word, but it's knowing how to use that knowledge so that I can become a better person and serve God more fully. Um, it says that the priests and the Levites, it mentions those 26 people, 26 priests and then, or 13 priests and then 13 Levites, who were all working hard to make the Bible clear. And some of that maybe is trying to explain some of the tougher words. Some of it's maybe... Um, Kind of trying to translate from one language into the other, but th the thought was, you know, we're here not just to put on a ceremony, but we're here to give you the ability to understand the Word of God clearly. So the priests and Levites worked hard to make it clear. The members worked hard to understand and to be faithful. Well, how do we know that they did understand the Bible? There's some clues here, and the first clue is that not only did they experience the, the grace of the Bible, but when they come to a point of understanding, they experience the grace, the second tool, which is conviction. Conviction is, is grace because it's at that point where we feel the pain of falling short of God's expectations. And it's probably the most palpable emotion in the story but it's tucked away in the end of verse 9. And so, uh, Nehemiah 8, 9. Nehemiah the governor and Ezra the priest. So we have the uh, leader of the state and the leader of the church, governor and priest. And all the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Because, here's the reason why, all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the Lord. Weeping as they listened to the Bible. Not just, wasn't because they were, people were reading it were doing a poor job and they're weeping because, man, that's, <laughs> you're doing such a horrible job. They were weeping because they understood. And they're weeping because they understood that Here's God's expectations, and here's my life, and there's a pretty big gap between God's expectations and my performance. And God loves me, and I've not returned his love. God's reached out to me, and I haven't grabbed hold of his hand. God's wanted to come alongside of me, and instead I turned my back on him. I am weeping because of I understand how my life hasn't taken advantage of all that God wanted to give me. That's grace. Conviction is, is a feeling that flows from full-fledged understanding. It's, it's not an embarrassment to be avoided. Um, I, I know in, in today's world, the idea of being convicted, that you feel bad about how you're doing or who you are, that's 
it's not really politically correct um, in a lot of our circles, most of our circles, but it's really, it's a grace to be received. So at the, the first of the year, uh, well, last year, 2020, I was, um, Jan and I were living in our home here in, in Eugene, but I was actually a, a pastor over in North Bend. I was an interim pastor there for five months. It was a great experience, wonderful people uh, in the North Bend, and, and God did a lot of nice things for us at the Bay Area Church of the Nazarene. Uh, but it's a little far away from home. And you're thinking, wow, did you drive out there every day? No, I didn't drive out there every day. But uh, no matter how often a week you have to drive it, it's still a long ways. It's, it's 100 miles, uh, two hours, almost exactly an hour to get to Florence, and almost an hour from Florence to where the church is in North Bend. I have to make every turn um, in my sleep right now. And what I would do is I would um, uh, drive out on Saturday, and we'd, uh, Jan and I would spend Saturday and Sunday there together. Jan would come home to work, and then I would uh, continue uh, working at the church uh, Monday and Tuesday and drive home sometime Tuesday. I tried to leave um, Tuesday afternoon so that I was still pretty awake for that drive by myself. But a couple times there were meetings during the day or, or counseling or just whatever goes on in the pastor's life. And so I found myself driving it late at night, maybe after um, um, a long board meeting a couple times. And this particular story, it was one of those, you know, there'd been a long board meeting. And so I think it's like 930. And um, I get in my car and say, well, God, you just need to keep me awake. And I'm struggling almost from the get-go. I'm struggling to stay awake, you know, and you kind of, and all of a sudden you wake up and, and you remember to get the car back on the road. And I'm driving along and there's this, um, the, the worst part of the drive is um, about a five-mile stretch where there's, it's like a spine because on both sides there's a pretty s steep drop-off. You don't, there isn't any really room for air on either side. And I'm driving through that, doing my best to stay awake, not succeeding not succeeding. And all of a sudden, there's bump, bump, bumpity, bump, bumpity, bump. You know, I hit that rumble strip on the right. <laughs> wow, that woke me up. Um, and it was grace, right? It was grace. It was conviction that I wasn't doing what I ought to be doing. It was grace. I was glad to be warned before I went over the cliff. I thought that was a pretty good deal. And that's what conviction is for us. Conviction is God coming into us both through our understanding and also through our feelings to say, you know, you're kind of on the rumble strip of life. You're, you're still okay, but one more d movement that direction and you won't be okay. It's going to be dangerous. Conviction is like the rumble strip. Uh, it says you're entering the danger zone. Now turn back before it's too late. Turning back, of course, uh, happens as we receive the next grace, which is called holiness. Now, tool number three is holiness. God's grace gives you spiritual holiness, gives you spiritual holiness, um, or wholeness, a wholeness and holiness in the English, two words that really reinforce each other. And we can see this in Nehemiah 8, uh, verses 9 through 11. Nehemiah 8. Verse 9. And so then Nehemiah the governor and Ezra the priest, teacher of the law, the Levites who were instructing the people, said to them, This day is holy to your Lord. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And then Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Uh, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites all uh, calmed the people by saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. We uh, call the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit for at least two reasons. One, the Holy Spirit is holy. The Holy Spirit is part of God. But we also call the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit because he gives holiness. The Holy Spirit comes to us and says, if you will receive it, I've got holiness, God's holiness that I want to give to you. This month, or actually um, for the first half of this year, 
the Free Methodist, our, our national church, is uh, refocusing and uh, trying to republicize, you know, what it really means to be a Free Methodist. What is the essential, absolute, necessary parts of really reflecting what being a Free Methodist is all alike? And they put together um, a nice little pamphlet. We've got a version of it out on our uh, welcome uh, table that you'd be welcome to take home with you. It's called the Free Methodist Way, and it highlights five different values that at the, are at the center point of whatever it means to be Free Methodist in, in any place. Um, and the very first one of those is holiness. And so my plan was back in November to say, you know, I think in February, March, April, and May, and I guess maybe June too, because there's five. So the, for those five months, the first um, Sunday of every month, I'm going to take one of those, I'll stop whatever I'm doing sermon-wise, and I'll take one of those values and just work through them in the same order that they will be published in um, our magazine called Light and Life. Well, um, so I was pretty amazed when I find that this is the Sunday that if I stayed with the sermon um, order that I'd planned, we'd be looking at Nehemiah 8, and that it's the day when the church has said, you know, why don't we talk about what it means to be a holy people? And I find in this passage is one of those Old Testament, not very many, but one of those Old Testament passages that talks about being holy. And so we've got God working together here, helping us be a restored people, a rebuilding so that we can be more effective for God than ever before. And it intersects with what our, our bishops and our church is telling us, you know, it'd be good to spend some time talking about what it means to be holy. Uh, Bishop um, Linda J. Adams in this month's um, February Light and Life, a lot of you got that. Uh, we, we sent it out through our email. email. But she said this, um, God both expects and empowers an all-encompassing holiness in the life of the believer. And she's playing there with the letter, words that begin with E. It's God's expectation, but it's also God's empowerment for all-encompassing holiness. God doesn't just say, hey, you got to do this, and then he whacks us every time that we don't, which is frankly what I grew up with in my mentality. I, I don't know where I got it from, but don't blame anyone else for it. But I had the idea that, yeah, God believes in holiness, and he wants me to be holy, and every time I'm not, he whacks me. Or he, ho or he waits until I die, and then he really whacks me. But she's right. Bishop Adams is right. God, he does expect. God does have high expectations, and it's called holiness. That's altogether right. That's the expectation. But it's also the grace. The name of the grace is the same thing. It's holiness that God gives us. He empowers us. He gives us his holiness. When he gives us Jesus, when he gives us the Holy Spirit, when he gives us the God and it lives within our hearts, not only are we going to heaven eventually, but we're filled with all the holiness that God expects right now. And so conviction doesn't lead to sadness, but to gladness. Because we find that God convicts us, and then whatever he convicts us of, he says, and by the way, here's exactly what you need, all of what you need. I just want to give it to you. We allow God to do a deep work, a deep work within our soul. You know, there, there's at least three different ways a person can, can, different reasons or a different path that a person can come to thinking that they're a pretty good person. And when I talk to people, and I've talked to a lot of people, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, um, about 85, 90% of people consider themselves to be good people. There's a few that are pretty hard on themselves and unreasonably hard on themselves, perhaps. Maybe realistically, I don't know. But um, there's three ways a person can come to the place where they say, you know, I think I'm a pretty good person. Um, the first way is to say, you know, I'm a good person because I'm a person and all people are good. All people are good. So I'm a good person. Um, that is pretty prevalent in American society right now is, you know, I'm a good person because all people are good. And, um, and what they've done at this point is they've eliminated any standard. I don't think it's really fully honest, at least from my understanding, because um, 
I say, I'm a basically good person because every person's a good person. But then you hear them talk about sex traffickers. <laughs> well, they're not so good persons. And then they talk about people that blow up buildings, and you can tell that they're pretty angry and that those people really aren't good people. And then they talk about how disappointed they are about people who uh, trick senior citizens out of all their life savings. And they're pretty angry and they're pretty negative on those people. So we've got standards. Um, and we may want to skew those standards so that I'm on the good side and you're on the bad side, but we've still got standards. And so that leads me to the second way that we can deal with goodness is that we can say, you know, there are some standards. There are some things that are expected. There are some regulations, some Ten Commandments, or just, you know, three or four things, or everyone needs to be good to everyone else. Maybe that's my standard. And there is a standard or some standards, and everyone's expected to work hard to reach that on their own. That, you know, morally, ethically, spiritually, it's, it's your responsibility to spend some effort trying to get to a point where you are whatever that definition of goodness is. There's a definition, there's a standard. You work hard to get to it. Maybe you'll get to it, maybe you won't, but you work hard. But holiness, you see, is the third way. Holiness is the third way. That there is a standard. It's a pretty precise standard. We can read about it. That's one of the values of the Old Testament. It's one of the values of the Bible. Ten Commandments, certainly, but also a lot in the New Testament. We're going through Matthew right now. And Jesus lays out some expectations of what it means to really be a disciple. There are expectations. But every time there's an expectation and this attitude of holiness, there is the awareness that God's grace brings you up to it. That you don't have to work yourself to get there. You accept God and you hop on the elevator of God's grace and it takes you right to the floor that you need to be on. God's standard. God's grace brings you up to God's standard. That is holiness. And it's why, it's why holiness brings us into joy, which is the next tool, the last tool. God uses joy as part of his grace um, toolkit in our lives. God's grace invites us into joy. Nehemiah 8, once again. Verses 12 through 17. And so the people did what they're told to do. They went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to, s to those who didn't have enough, to celebrate with great joy. Because now they understood the word of the law made known to them. They understood. Led them to joy. 13, on the second day of the month, all the heads of the families, together with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, to give attention to the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival in the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout the towns in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from the olive tree and from wild olive trees, from myrtles, palms, shade trees, and make temporary shelters, as it was written. And so the people went out and brought back those branches and they built themselves the temporary shelters on their own roofs or some in their courtyards and some in the courts of the house of God, some in the square by the water gate and even by the gate of Ephraim. And a whole company had returned from exile, all of them. They built these temporary shelters and they lived in them. And from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated Feast of Tabernacles, like this. And their joy, their joy was very great. Talking about joy, and actually, back in verse 10, um, Nehemiah says, You need to go to your house and you need to eat the choice foods, is kind of a delicate way that our translation has it. Because the actual translation is, You need to go back to your house and eat lots of fatty food. You need to go to your house and eat lots of fatty food. So when I think of fatty food, you know, I think of donuts. Um, if someone wants to give me a good time, they know you can, you can bring Mark a donut. It's going to pick up the spirits. Um, I, I, and my wife, 
When she thinks of fatty food, she thinks of, of ice cream. Of course, she thinks of low-cal ice cream, but um, I, I'm the donut guy, and Jan's the ice cream guy. And uh, today, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about, uh, you know, about 3 o'clock, there's going to be the nachos, or maybe pizza, um, because today's one of those days, um, it's not the seventh, first day of the seventh month, it's Super Bowl day, and I think there's going to be a lot of you who are choosing that this is the one day out of the year when I lay aside um, my good diet, and I just have a lot of good fatty foods. I have the choice foods. It's going to be a celebration. It's, in other words, it's going to be a party. And Nehemiah and all those priests and all the Levites with all the strange-sounding names, they're saying, go to your house and have a party. You know, have the best party. And by the way, make sure that you give some food to the people around you who don't have enough to party on their own. Have a party. Um, and uh, then it says, oh, and, and here's, here's a, a kind of a fun way to do the party. And this party, you're going to party for all the next week. And you're going to do it by basically camping out in the backyard. They had to go get these branches and make temporary shelters um, in their backyards. And some did it in the courtyard. Some did it, in, you know, in, in um, front of, of the bank downtown. And I said they, they did it all over. But they had these temporary shelters and they lived outside or they slept outside for a week. It was um, the joy of of camping. I, I remember when our, our, our uh, kids were in high school and we were living in the great state of Kansas. And uh, one of the nice things about Kansas is there's um, almost no people and no light pollution. And I think like the second or third year that we were there, we thought, let's go out there in the Perseid meteor shower, you know, the one that comes in August. And um, we'll, we'll go out and we'll get our sleeping bags. We'll lay down a um, a tarp and get our sleeping bags for all four of us and we'll just sleep all night outside and uh, we'll, we will watch the New Year's go by. Now I have to tell you, there weren't quite as many meteors as the scientists promised us. There were a couple, but there weren't quite as many meteors as, but, but we had a terrific time. It was a family bonding time. You know, we were outside, we could hear the crickets, we could feel uh, the air change, and we were doing it together. And there was just something very special about that camping out in the backyard. And that kind of specialness is uh, what th the Jewish people were to experience with their families and with their communities every year. Um, it's built into the Jewish system that... Uh, I think it's four or five times a year, there are these nationwide parties that you have, and you have them together, and they're, it's a celebration. And this is the Feast of Tabernacles. You feel the joy of God. And you feel the God, joy of God making you whole. It's not just that you get to eat fatty foods, but it says, you know, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy flows out of a sense that well, there was this expectation, and my performance didn't really meet the expectation, but God is at work in me, bringing me up to the, I'm on the, the elevator of grace, and there isn't anything I have to do about it. I just have to receive what God wants to do, and every day there's the elevation of grace in my life, and God is making me what he expects me to be, and I'm allowing him to do that, and it is a joyous experience. When uh, we were living in the great state of Washington, uh, pastoring the church in Vancouver. Um, we, we took our community and uh, members of the church as well. It was an evangelistic outreach. Um, and we did a thing called Alpha, which is a, a wonderful 13-week uh, program. And we just explain what it means in ordinary 21st century language to, to be part of what God is doing in the world. And halfway through that time, we take a retreat, and we, we went out to one of the retreat centers, and um, one of the, the things that we built into that, you know, we really built everything, so there was this climactic event 
uh, where we presented people and said, you know, here's the opportunity for you to receive holiness. Not just to be saved and know that you're going to heaven. That's fine. Some of you had that, some of you don't. But what we're talking about is the joy of knowing that God is bringing you to what he wants you to be and God is filling you with the power of his Holy Spirit to make you a whole different kind of person. And so we had that event and during that event, you know, people had the choice, chance to say, you know, God has done something special to me because I've received that gift of holiness. And two or three people raised their hands. I'm always a little bit pessimistic. I'm sorry. But a little bit pessimistic when you have a very emotional event and you kind of built a lot into it. and You've kind of almost pressured people. And, you know, three or four people raise their hands. I kind of wonder, are they just really doing that because uh, they're emotional now or because they want to please me? Or has God really done this transforming thing that's going to make a difference forever? And so what a wonderful experience it was for me. Um, I think it was like two weeks later, uh, Jane, who'd been part of that retreat, she came up to me Sunday morning, and, and her face was just kind of a glow all over the place. And she said, Pastor Mark, am I still supposed to have all this joy in my life? And I said, yes, this is what it means to be a holy person. Not that we're critical of everyone else that's not holy, not that we're worried about what rules we're going to disobey, but a sense that I can't believe it. God is choosing to make me all that he ever wanted me to be. Oh, we feel joy all the time. We might also feel stress sometimes, but it's stress with joy. Or worry or, or grief, of course, with joy. And it's that phrase from John 4 and the old chorus, I've got a river of life. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Joy is uh, the last of the tools that we'll talk about this morning. So as our worship team comes up, um, I want to summarize um, this way with a couple last thoughts. Uh, the first is about conviction. Um, it's a time for conviction. It's good. Those rumble strips are good things. They call us back into where God wants us to be and God will allow us to be all that we should be. Uh, some of us, you know, maybe it's this morning conviction for the fact that we, we have too much of a habit of getting angry and just blowing it all up over someone else. Maybe some, there's a conviction that, that your, your sexual life is outside of God's norms. Maybe it's that, you know, no one else knows this, but I know I live such an incredible double life. And you're feeling convicted that rather than living the life of deceit, God's calling you in to honesty. Maybe it's simply a vague but very persistent, there's something missing in my life. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm missing peace or purpose or self-esteem, but there's something, undif I'm not even sure what it is, but I know it's missing. That's th all those things are conviction, and they lead us into openness to holiness, which is saying that whatever is missing, God wants to fill. He wants to give you the joy as what makes it all that person should be, that he gives that to you. Or that whatever is wrong, God wants to make right. He, he replaces anger with understanding. Sexual sin with faithfulness and with self-control. Deceit with courage. With courage. Whatever is wrong, God wants to make it right. <laughs> I wrote my notes at this point. I said, I should try to make you feel the incredible passion I have for this topic and the passion that you would have all of that God wants to give to you. And then God said, hey, Mark, I don't care if they know how passionate you are. I want them to know how passionate I am. That God is passionate about holiness because God is holy and he wants us to experience all that he can do as we allow him to make us holy. That it's not okay just to limp along. That we can't redefine the rules and say, well, there aren't any expectations and so I'm automatically good. To be honest, to say, there's a standard. I'm not making it on my own. <laughs> I'm starting to find out I probably will never make it on my own. But thanks be to God, everything God expects, he empowers. And that's what we have the altars for. So as we stand up and sing, 
You know, if there's some way in your life, or you just have a, a need or a burden or a prayer, you, you can come to the altar for whatever God brings you to the altar. But it's an opportunity this morning to say, God, I'm willing to give you permission to be all that you want to be and to be all that you want to be in my life today.
In uh, Romans 10, there's a, a great, really common, commonly quoted phrase that uh, goes like this. Uh, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's with your heart you believe and are justified, and with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Um, and so I'm thinking here in the church, probably for some, but especially for you at home, you, there's not an altar for you to go through. What could you do? Well, if God has moved you in some particular way just to receive grace or to be open to confession or a new commitment to the Bible, there's something that God has stirred your heart to do. When, when this gig is over, don't just switch over to the pregame for the Super Bowl. Spend half an hour talking about in, in your house about what God did for you during the worship service and um, what God has put on your heart and the questions that you have. Um, there's a whole lot of day to be had for uh, other good and fun things, but take that precious time to say, I'm not only going to believe in my heart, but I'm going to profess with my lips. And every one of you at home has the ability to do that, and I just hope that you will this morning. Who is our chain breaker? Freedom, the saving, he 
He's a prison shaking savior. He's got chains. He's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day, dead of night. We all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. Oh, and the a better way, and the better way. Well, if you've got pain, he's a pain taker. Oh, if you feel love, he's a way maker. To do freedom, we're saving. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. Can't feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. If you believe it, what you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. He's a changer. Love. He's a way maker. If you need freedom, we'll say it. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains. He's a chain breaker. Or if you need freedom, we'll say it. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains. He's a chain breaker. Heavenly Father, we just come to you now just to give thanks. We thank you for being able to come together and, and, and do that. And we just, uh, we just thank you for your spirit and just uh, continue to lead the whole body here. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, just uh, bless this offering that we're going to receive today and, and uh, help us to go out and use that scripture like uh, Mark said and, and apply it and, and just do your, uh, do your mission here. We just thank you, Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. Yeah.